Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about one of the major mysteries of planet Earth. The mystery being, why is it that we are actually here? How is it that life exists on Earth, and how is it that it was able to survive for over 3 billion years? What makes our planet so special, and most importantly, are we going to be able to find some other planet out there that has very similar features, specifically, a planet with alien life? And so in some sense, we're going to be talking about the very famous Fermi Paradox. Where is everybody? But at the same time, we're actually going to be touching on something a little bit more specific and more scientific. Why does life exist here and can it exist somewhere else? And all of this is going to be based on a relatively recent and actually very intriguing study that as always you can find in the description below. With the main premise of the study being relatively simple to understand. Let's say we take a bunch of Earths. How likely is the life going to evolve on them, assuming that certain conditions change with time? And can we actually recreate the same type of an Earth that we have today with actual functioning life on the surface, assuming that each of these Earths is going to undergo billions of years of evolution and various climatic changes? And so here we are really trying to understand how is it that our own planet Earth was able to maintain life for so long? and was able to maintain conditions necessary for life to thrive for over three and a half billion years, possibly even longer than that. Today we know that even over short periods of time it's possible for climate to change quite dramatically, not necessarily because of the human influence even, but for example because of various volcanic eruptions or various other major events that have actually influenced climate for the past few thousands of years. And when it comes to longer periods of time or so-called geological timelines, it's possible to find periods when temperature dropped or gone up by a dramatic amount. With some of the fluctuations visible in this graph right here that shows you how the temperature does change quite a lot if you look at the period of millions of years here. But for some reason life still managed to survive and the overall climate always returned back to normal and always somehow maintained itself. And so even after three and a half billion years, Earth still managed to maintain a life on the surface. But the same cannot be said of other nearby planets. We know that both Mars and Venus may have also started as Earth is today, with liquid water on the surface, with functioning oceans and thick atmosphere, and obviously the potentials for creating life. Yet we also know that both Mars and Venus have dramatically transformed, losing water, liquid water, and of course, any potential for habitable conditions over the past few billion years. So something definitely changed these planets. And that something also could have changed planet Earth, yet it didn't. And then we also have the question of exoplanets. For the past few years we've been focusing on trying to discover the exoplanets in the so-called habitable zone of the star system, the zone where we believe liquid water can exist. Hypothetically this would help us discover alien life as well, in other words help us answer the so-called Fermi paradox, at least to some extent. But knowing what we know about planet Earth today, and also knowing what we know about planets like Mars and Venus, we also understand that things could have gone wrong for Earth so many times. The temperature on planet Earth could have been hypothetically way below zero right now, or it could also be over boiling point of water. Something stabilized the system. Even though technically the planet should not have been habitable after 3 billion years, because we're still here and because life on Earth has not been destroyed yet, we know that something is definitely different about our planet and something is definitely happening here. Like for example, one of the biggest questions that scientists are still having trouble answering is in regards to the so-called faint young sun paradox. And this is the idea that the sun has changed so much over time that it should have actually made our planet way too hot right now. As a matter of fact, in the past uh, four and a half billion years, the sun has become roughly around 30% more luminous than it used to be. And somehow Earth still maintained habitable conditions throughout this whole period, allowing the life to evolve and to thrive. And though that theoretically Earth should have stayed a snowball Earth for a very very long period of time, and most likely not allow life to evolve, or to at least evolve the ability to, for example, photosynthesize, because there would be no way for um, anything to receive sunlight, we know that Earth does not look like that at all. And so a lot of this theory versus reality doesn't really add up here. But to try to explain all of this, today there are two major ideas, or I guess in some sense two main theories. The first one speculates that there is some sort of a feedback mechanism, almost like a thermostat, that essentially controls the temperature of the planet and more or less keeps it neutral for life. 
We obviously don't really understand how it works yet, but it's probably something to do with the biosphere or life itself, essentially maintaining the um, atmosphere and the temperature of the planet, making it habitable and maintaining the necessary conditions. But this particular hypothesis is not really well defined and also obviously has no proof whatsoever. Which is where the second hypothesis makes a little bit more sense. Although the second hypothesis is not particularly satisfactory. Because all it says is that the reason Earth is like it is today is actually purely by chance. It was nothing but luck that created the planet that we know today, and it's luck that's continuously sort of maintaining the planet as it is today. Now that is a very very big statement, but here's the thing. That's pretty much exactly what this particular study wanted to investigate, and that is sort of what the scientists in the study discovered as well. That we're here by chance, and the Earth is like it is today also by chance. And the other planets just didn't really get lucky. And that also includes all of the potential discoveries we make in the future once we start discovering more exoplanets in the habitable zones. Today, due to the sheer size of the Milky Way galaxy, we expect there to be billions and billions of Earth-like planets. Planets very similar to Earth both in appearance and of course in, well, essentially surface features. We expect there to be planets with liquid water, we expect some planets to possibly even have chance of developing life, but we also expect some planets, despite all of these features, to still have the same sort of situation as Venus and Mars, eventually lose the ability to be habitable. And so understanding what causes all of this is actually really important. And one way we can try to study all of this, and this is exactly what the scientists in this paper did, is by creating a lot of different Earth-like planets. But each of them receives slightly different conditions, specifically randomly selected climate feedback conditions, with each of them being able to manage climatic changes and temperature changes to a different extent. Some of them being really good at it, but only good at one thing, other ones being not so good at certain other things. The best example of a typical feedback condition on Earth is actually in regards to ice cover and the reflectivity of ice itself. If for some reason our planet starts to lose a lot of the ice present in Antarctica, and by the way one of the reasons ice is white is actually because it's very reflective, those regions will then start to become darker and start to absorb a lot more solar energy which will in turn warm up the planet and melt even more ice. The more ice melts, the warmer the planet becomes. And this is sort of a cycle that keeps repeating itself until some other major event that starts to introduce ice once again. And this is one of the feedback mechanisms that sort of works on various planets. Volcanoes, on the other hand, introduce the opposite of that feedback mechanism. By releasing tremendous amounts of, for example, sulfur oxides, all of this dust starts blocking the sunlight and allows the planet to cool down to the point where ice starts forming. Ice is reflective, it reflects even more light, cooling down the planet even more, and thus the ice starts growing across the entire planet. And this is actually one of the reasons why volcanic eruptions and, for example, asteroid collisions, such as the one that killed dinosaurs, release so many different gases into the atmosphere that the planet eventually became ridiculously cold. And so in this study, the scientists behind this paper chose 100,000 different random planets, very similar to planet Earth in the beginning, and assigned various random feedback mechanisms to each of them. And following this, for each planet, he ran the simulations 100 times, just to see what happens at the end. Will all of them survive and become habitable, or will only some of the planets remain as they were and maintain conditions necessary for life? Now, because each of these planets was slightly different and because the feedback mechanisms work slightly differently as well, it was natural that some of the planets will probably become less hospitable and eventually become similar to Venus or Mars. And in each of these trials, each of these 100,000 planets was tracked for basically equivalent of about 3 billion years until it either became too cold or too hot, because at this point there was no way of going back to having life on the surface. We know that, for example, Earth never really became too cold to the point where it was entirely frozen or too hot where it was basically above the boiling temperature of water. Even when it was what's known as an ice bowl Earth, the temperature on the inside was still relatively manageable. And so our planet definitely has some sort of a feedback mechanism that seems to maintain this stability long term. But in this particular simulation, in this study, quite shockingly, out of 100,000 planets simulated, 100 times each, 
only one was able to maintain conditions long term. And in this particular case, only one planet was able to maintain these conditions each of the 100 simulations. With most of the other planets only being able to maintain habitable conditions around 10 out of 100 times. Or to be more exact, 90% of the time, all of the other planets stop being habitable only after a few million years, in some cases a billion years or so. And it seems that in every simulation that the scientists ran in this study, it was really just luck that led to planet Earth with habitable conditions after 3 billion years. Which of course suggests that even having feedback mechanisms that can protect the planet is not enough. The planet still has to be lucky. It's a human term, it's also a term that we can't really mathematically describe very well, but chance seems to play a really important role in helping planets to stay habitable for billions of years. And personally, after reading the study and after reading the results, I didn't really feel satisfaction. It felt like something was missing. How can chance, how can fortune determine everything? But it does make sense. It makes a lot of sense because we know from real life, fortune and chance does actually play a big role in a lot of things around us. We don't really understand what it is, but it's definitely something that helps a lot of things happen as they happen. What's more though, is that this actually does help us answer the question of Fermi paradox to some extent. The reason why we're not actually seeing these transmissions and signals coming from distant planets, from planets who expect to have life on them, is because those planets most likely weren't lucky enough to develop life or at least to maintain it long term. So what this study suggests is that life, especially intelligent life, especially advanced intelligent life, is a lot less likely and has to be a lot more fortunate to survive than we initially thought than we currently estimate using our current understanding. And so even though we're going to find a lot of stars out there that are practically exactly the same as our own sun, and we're also going to find a lot of exoplanets with potentially even liquid water on the surface, according to the study, only about 1 in 100,000 of them will be lucky enough to maintain conditions long enough for life to thrive and for life to develop something intelligent and something advanced. And if we go back to the original assumption that there's anywhere between 2 and maybe 4 billion different Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy, this means that maybe about 20,000 to maybe 40,000 of them will be lucky enough to maintain conditions long enough to help life evolve and become advanced. But how many of those planets will have intelligent life? That's a question for another day. We don't really know. But since we're not hearing anyone and we're not seeing any transmissions coming our way and we're probably not going to be hearing anything for a very long time, if ever, this does suggest that this particular study has a lot of interesting ideas that we need to investigate in a little bit more detail. Although mathematically at least, and scientifically, the idea of chance or luck is extremely difficult to explain. And I guess to try to understand all of this a little bit better, we're going to have to revise our theories of probability, at least for space sciences. But anyway, that's kind of all I wanted to mention in this video, so if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, check out the study in the description below, and maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Also, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye